Hello, I'm Jessie Gray. Welcome back to Personalities. We have two faces that you've probably seen on other shows if you watch us each week. They're two artists who are part of a group of 11 artists currently showing at the Ingber Gallery. That their paintings are showing there. It's at 3 E 78th Street, and the exhibition continues through August 1st. Right next to me is my husband, Don Gray. You've seen him as, on his own show, Artist and Critic, uh, at 6 p.m. on Sunday evenings and at 3.30 on Tuesdays. And next to Don Gray, we haven't gotten to Don Gray yet. Uh, no, oh, here we go, okay, is Philip Sherrod. He is the initiating member and our leader in a group called the Street Painters. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. <laughs> And we welcome you both today. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to take you to our leader's studio, his painting studio, and we're going to talk a little bit today about what it's like to be an artist, especially an artist who committed to art painting against not the mainstream, but the uh, fashionable stream of art for the last 20 years, trying to produce a meaningful art as art that is recognized became more and more depersonalized, dehumanized, mechanized, and minimized. We'll really go into that in depth today, and a great way to open it is this shot of Philip Sherrod painting in his studio. Phil, could you tell us just a little bit about who you're painting and when? And well, uh, <coughs> I'm painting Judy um, Arvinette and it was a small portrait that I did, I think, in 1973. And it shows the interior, I guess, of uh, paintings on the wall. And contrary to, I guess, the, the modern approach of the institutionalized or academic, I like to have all of my paintings facing me, at least those I've got on the wall, and I fill every inch and nook and cranny with an image uh, of color and vision. Because I forget who I am, and I, I'm that uh, oriented to an obsession, I guess, with color and so forth. Now, every artist usually outpaints his studio surroundings, and you're no exception. Your, your walls are literally closing in. You've painted so many paintings, am I right? Mm, that's right, yeah. And right here is Philip's kitchen. This is the stove and the, the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> stove, refrigerator, <laughs> yeah, cabinet, yeah. yeah that's, where, that's where I mix my paints. I cook the paints, yeah. What is it like to, what has it been like painting for the last 20 years? <clears throat> <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know exactly, uh, you know, You what, came what to New York when? Where uh, are you going? You know, what, 1959 what or 60. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's not a matter of, uh, yeah, what keeps one going is that if, if you're a painter, you paint. And uh, I think that uh, images change or life changes. Uh, but there's always something to see and look at and, and work on. Uh, Are you ever depressed and, and upset uh, when you feel that, uh, for example, uh, we're having our exhibition at the uh, Ingber Gallery coming up, the street painters, and frankly, don't you think it, it takes a lot of gall, don't you think we have to have a lot of gall as a group to say that our work can uh, in the face of a, a monolithic art establishment that controls art completely different than the kind we produce, doesn't it take a lot of gall to show it? And how long is it going to take before our work might be accepted? Well, I, I think that maybe society has got to come to a state of uh, self or individualism. I, I think that uh, what's going on today is a vogue-oriented society, uh, education and so forth, where the collective number and group uh, if you belong to or dress like, I think that you come across. I think that uh, I think the serious artist today is really more concerned about an individual attempt to grasp uh, his identity through what he can see. And I think, uh, contrary to the modern promotion of facts and Hollywood-oriented um, education, uh, stars, the idiom of stars and pop rock artists, this type of thing, uh, drugs and all of this. I think that the uh, individual artist is, is a quiet loner. 
and I think he always was. I'm talking about the better artists or those that reached underneath the surface of things. I think that, uh, that to do that sort of thing, you can't participate too much in life. You're, 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 uh, you're painting from uh, a world of your own uh, intensity. You have to paint pictures. Uh, I think what keeps people going <clears throat> and uh, well, what keeps me going is simply uh, a person's alive and, and you have to continue functioning and you certainly don't need the, anybody else's approval to keep producing paintings. I mean, you're doing what you want to do. They mean uh, a lot to you. I mean, really, they're an artist's very life, his work, and you just keep painting and painting and painting, and perhaps uh, one day others will uh, come to see the world with some of the vigor and the vividness that uh, people, artists, and there are very few of them today, who actually look at the world and paint from it. Uh, just mm -hmm. before we came down, I was looking at a uh, program on Channel 13, a uh, Skyline program dedicated uh, presumably to an avant-garde non-museum. I think it was in Queens. They made it out of a grade school. And they were talking about how they were trying to give uh, adventurous artists a chance. Now, I, I, w I immediately thought of us as being adventurous artists, and, and maybe they'd want to give us a chance to show some of the street painters. And then I, I learned that one of the most popular uh, exhibitions they had there was um, a fellow had cages of pigeons, or maybe they were doves, around the hall. And I think he might have shown a movie of pigeons or doves sometime during the exhibition. Then the grand finale of the exhibition was to let the doves go, or the pigeons go, whatever they were. And they all flew off, and that was the artwork. Well, that's, that's the, I think that's a collective image, again, in, in an ideal state involving nothing of art but participation. I mean, everyone in his dove goes his own way in freedom. I mean, that's a very trite understanding, as far as I'm concerned, of, of the real issues. I mean, a, a young painter starts out, and I think that he is astounded, or he's, 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 uh, he wants to focus in on the images that come to him via his own sight of individualism. And I think that's what separates art. I think it's an individual trek. I think that all the participatory type of uh, we all understand social issues, these are just, uh, I think, collective indulgent states uh, leading to nothing, mind you, because the image doesn't build where the real artist works with his imagery until it finally intermeshes into a statement. Uh, and it comes out representing uh, his questions versus the environment and times and so forth, or for, or, or whatever. Go ahead. Well, you've come to this realization now that is, is an individual, well, you always knew it was an individual effort. I always felt it was this, yeah. And I, you've come yeah, to the realization yeah. that you are doing what you want to do, you're painting almost for yourself. Yeah, but that's what when you started out 20 years ago and you didn't have enough tubes or money to buy tubes of paint and you're cramped and you'd like to move into a larger space because you can't even fit the size canvases in that you'd like to do into your studio because your paintings are literally <laughs> crowding in on you and you don't have enough money for that. Uh, how does that make you feel when you see things like these doves and being let loose immediately catch someone's fancy and probably get, get a grant? Well, I, well that, 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 that really does, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't because, bother you. No, Did it ever I, bother you? No, no, no. Uh, it's always irritated me. When I was younger, yes, it used to bring me to maybe anger, but there's no anger when you know that your self, as a state maybe of knowledge or talent, eventually will take over even that type of Did collective... Did you realize uh, that at the beginning? Yeah, I always felt the same way. I've always felt, uh, I've always hated gimmicks. I always hated gimmickry and, and plagiarism. But did you of, realize uh, that your art would ultimately survive where that would, of course, is just part of the passing? I, I, yeah, I feel so. I feel so because I've got a self, and I think that if you check the annuals and history of art, the only thing that inter has always interests me, even in, in, in the centuries of painting, I've never liked a uh, popular artist in a way, those that meet more of a social issue. I always have liked the extremists, the eccentrics, uh, those that were, well, who? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say for the life of him, a guy like Titian, somehow was a different type of being than those artists around him, as was Michelangelo, as was Rembrandt, uh, even Chardin as a Frenchman. Uh, you know, they complained about Chardin that he took too long to paint a picture, and that was entering into that 
uh, mechanistic, uh, hyper psyched, souped up, speeded uh, art that we live in. To be yeah, they, they wanted him to become more like them, and so they said that you know, it takes, the critics used to criticize one of the great comments was it takes too long for him to paint a picture, which is ridiculous. I mean, after all, you know, what obligation do I have, you, Chardin, or the next person? Uh, outside of the self, to uh, if you don't relate to the self, you're lost, and that's why so many disappear. And you could take you could take many. You could take the popular artists like Peter Max. He's no artist. He's a social uh, icon of what they would like to call an artist. They promote him. They indulge him, and he has no idiom other than commercials and illustration, which is what he is. Incidentally, he's a uh, he, he's he's not an artist. He's an illustrator. He's uh, he how, pleases did art, the crowd. how did art get so superficial? That, that's always been the well. I, the I can, you know, I'm not going to take on that type of you know. Uh, art has always been superficial to 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 maybe a few people uh, or to the majority. It's only the artist that daily wakes up and has the problem of how does he get the paint, how does he pay the bill of the rent, and and how does he get to his image within a certain amount of time? How long does he can he spend painting? You know. Uh, how does an artist buy tubes of paint and pay the rent? Well, they've all done it differently. <laughs> Some steal. <laughs> but I don't know who from. <laughs> um, I don't know, Don. Let's, let's ask you. I mean, how does an artist get tubes of paint? Well, I mean, it, it definitely I've, has got to affect his style, I think. Well, I've always uh, had some kind of a job. Uh, actually, Jesse worked for four or five, maybe it was six years, and I. I just painted, but I've worked in everything from picture frame shops to waiting table to pushing hand trucks in warehouses. And then about the age of 31, I started teaching at a college because I figured, well, what the hell, I, I'm tired of doing all the other crap. You know, I, I've been through that and it's, it's boring and tedious and, and teaching in itself can be boring and tedious and it can be uh, absolutely deadly to an artist. I've seen so many <clears throat> Uh, artists, the teachers that I once had, uh, <clears throat> ceased to be artists, uh, and I'm very aware of the of the danger lying in that. But that's what I've been doing for the past uh, ten years, I guess, um, to make money to support the painting. And uh, I guess if I ever felt that I became a teacher rather than a painter, I'd get the hell out of there and uh, maybe go back to waiting table or pushing the hand truck or something. But you know, I mean, the world is so essentially tedious in the in the things that that people are required to do, to earn money, to to make this desperate, deadly thing we call a living, and it just has always been very tedious and and frustrating to well, to me. Yeah, yeah, and but very uh, boring and and uh, yeah, yeah, uh, time consuming yeah. and a, essentially a waste. Uh, do you ever feel? blessed to the extent that at least that that is probably somebody's whole life and that you well, it affects the imagery more? that that's what I want to bring up it affects the imagery uh, whether you get a grant whether you struggle waiting tables whether you sell a few paintings which I I've been lucky enough to do uh, it affects the imagery and uh, I once thought that I could com compete with a commercialized world in a sense that I'm fairly prolific but then it comes a time where you begin to brush in the image and it begins to change. Uh, I mean, an artist is extremely sensitive and affected by life. Uh, if you get a little too much money, I, I think there's a possibility, or brush in too many canvases, uh, the image becomes lighter or becomes, there's a greater speed comes into the painting. And I've never known to what depth I was touching any subject or reality when I was brushing in an area. I've always known when it wasn't quite right. Uh, but uh, I, I, I mean, guys that get a lot of money, let's say through a grant, I don't think it helps them. And I do think that success does spoil the artist, because I think the artist has got to, to a degree, from what I know, suffer to continue. It's almost like a feeding before one. And I know that that's an over-romanticized idea. I, but I, I hate to hear. I hate to hear you say that. Well, because, I hate to hear it too because it's what I do. Because but, uh, that's what the society will <clears throat> how the society will like justify to, its treatment of the artist yeah, by ignoring yeah. it. Say we're doing it for their own good. Yeah. We're leaving them. We're ignoring them. We're leaving them to their own devices. 
And if, and, and if they can somehow survive and pu produce masterpieces, maybe we'll recognize them when they're 60 or 70, or maybe mm -hmm. 10 or 20 years after their death. I, I don't think anyone has to suffer. I think they just have to be intensely alive uh, in order to produce art. And I think one of the challenges for any creative person is success, whether it's an actor or a writer or a painter, uh, because y you can be cajoled away from your initial intent and the power of your intent and everybody's applauding you and saying how great you are and um, um, no that's that's I, a good issue I, I yeah that's a good thing. issue yeah so it, so I, I think success is the great challenge I think suffering is a great challenge because it can kill you it can crush you it can stop you from painting it can make you totally bitter and cynical and withdraw from from the world and it can poison your art but I think success can poison it just as well with honey uh, be, you know, because you cease to have the force and the... Well, different art. artists have done different things. A guy like Rubens was able to... Well, I, think, I think it, Rembrandt was successful for a time. Well, or, there's got to be a certain you know, success I mean, or you don't different. continue. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, uh, but I to mean, what degree do you need success, Jesse or myself, relative to continuance? It depends different on all three of us. Do you find your, your and, view uh, of success changing? Say, it's, what yeah, is your view yeah. at 20 and what is your view now, 20 years later? having not had a, what you'd call, commercial success? Well, uh, if, if I'm not speaking too much here, <laughs> I could come in again and say that when I was younger, I thought success had to do more with uh, a certain degree of uh, financial uh, popularity uh, so that I, I still had the fear of a lot of my work being destroyed. Uh, it's been collected by various people and, and, and so forth, museums, but I, I, I still wonder if, uh, if a lot of the work's going to be lost. I mean, you know, there are different, different things happen to different people's work. But uh, now I think the success is more retaining a self where everybody else varies uh, and maybe loses their head or forgets what their intentions were or they don't find anything else within their symbols to feed the image so that they can com keep developing a voice, a statement. I mean, I might say that Michener, last night on the South uh, Pacific Islands on TV, which I occasionally am caught watching, uh, I was amused how he, he seemingly tried to speak to the public about Gauguin's illusion or disillusionment that ultimately Gauguin was an artist but that his work uh, represented a, a seeking the ideal Eden and all of that nonsense. I think that's uh, almost kind of tried as an issue. I mean, what difference does that have to do how a man gets his image as long as he's able to continue in his own lifetime to reproduce? I've always thought he was responding to the pressures of modern life <clears throat> industrialism. Uh, you know, looking for the well, that's, that's uh, sure a, a greater existence. About Michener has reverted, reverted that, um, um, yeah. Did you want to talk about the pictures, Justin? He might be there? talking about himself with Gauguin. That might be more the truth. Yeah. Should we go to the, the photographs? We have 10 minutes left to show the work. And um, this is one of Phil Chirons. Well, that's Elena of the Rowlands. Um, it's one of my absurdest states of the human condition today, and it happens to be a, a, a woman set among, um, what do you want to call them, artificial or natural icons of the age representing our um, existence in a black void or a dark background. And those icons are everything from uh, sardines Feathers to, <laughs> to tabby <laughs> cat, cat food and rolling macro filet and so forth. And here's one of Don's. Well, I, uh, this is in the exhibition, isn't it? Yeah, this is in the ex 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 exhibition. Yeah. It was <clears throat> It's one of the few I painted from a drawing that I did on 72nd Street. And um, uh, it was a new experience for me. And I, uh, but really, I consider myself to be a realist and working from nature and reality. And I was just interested in the signs, the storefronts, and the various colors of containers and so forth, and the uh, uh, relationship of the figure moving toward the uh, delivery bicycle. There's sort of psychological implications there that we don't have to go into. We're, we all say we're interested in reality because we're interested in visually in what we see around us, but we're only interested in it if it's distilled through our own personalities. We're really not very interested in a direct uh, 
minute uh, replica of what we're seeing, aren't we? Isn't that sure. what this, the street painters are all about? I think every, uh, every artist, whether they're significant or not, distills their images they, through their personalities. And I think that we're trying to have as much life and vitality and response to life as possible in our paintings. And, and Phil, obviously, is doing it very much here in his portrait of a friend, I guess. Is that right, Phil? That's uh, Robin, you know, Robin Brown from Brooklyn, yeah. It's, uh, I, I think that particular piece was a response to just the human being. As he responded to me, I responded to him. But, uh, Phil, how long does it take you to do a painting? Some people spend months on painting. Some people spend no time at all. <laughs> well, it, it depends on what type of painting I'm working with. It's a direct street painting, which sometimes takes two hours or three. It depends on the size of canvas. Uh, and then I come in work a week, this, two weeks later. Wrong? That's uh, no, it's, no, 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 that's, that's right. Yeah. That's okay. right. It's, it's up. That's uh, that's Susan Woodchuck and Blue Jay, uh, a thematic painting again, representing uh, uh, everything from the sensual disposalness uh, of uh, commercial items to uh, the naturalness of laying among the muck of commercial. Uh, Icons. It's uh, it's just a symbolic painting again. It's a, it's a Venus type of thing. When you paint, Phil, just to go into painting a little, you don't do you sketch it all out beforehand, or no, do you I, just start? No, no, in what's your initial response? Do you to what? Well, when you when you say she was the woman like, or the soda? <laughs> do you Good, respond? Do you see a color? Favorably. Do you start with a color note, or do you even uh, know how you start, or is it different every time? I really don't remember how to paint each time I start to paint. It just happens. Uh, I pick up a color, and, and I don't get started at the same time. Uh, various areas start themselves. Sometimes I start, you know, on a hand, a neck, uh, end of a thigh, or a kneecap, or an eye. I, I don't know. You know, it always varies. Uh, I don't lay out my compositions in the old neoclassical way and grit it down and all that nonsense, because I, I'm more interested in grasping life, the fullness of it, the immediacy of it, and to hell with all of those uh, stymieing type of approaches. Uh, I, I don't like them. It's, uh, Did you have to unlearn those stymieing approaches? So many people go to an art school, so-called art school, and they, um, they, they learn to be stultified. Then they spend about five years unlearning what <coughs> they've learned. Well, I... I from my viewpoint of self, I've always had a vision of what I wanted and what I liked as opposed to what I could do or what I found uh, in a physical replica. But uh, it's true that every time I get an area going together, I'm always surprised how it comes out. So if that explains something of the irrational approach to creativity, uh, rather than knowing what one not only wants, but uh, getting what one might attempt. So I, I don't know how to explain the that question. Why, why don't you put that one up, uh, Jesse? Put that put that one up of yours. Let's talk. Well, about let's that. go. All right. Let's go. Just to, since we're were you talking about your paintings? That's Elena of the Rings, and that represents maybe the reflective sadness that one can accumulate with a sensitive psyche uh, and mind after finding out that the world of objects, subjects, and uh, money do not relate to the inner spirit. And I think that that might be very much the apathy of the uh, of the uh, concerns of the world today. I think that uh, one can acquire a lot of wealth, and it's, of course it's an obvious thing, but then again to do it in a painting to make it lasting and uh, living as a statement. In fact, those objects represent represented things that I gave Elena. And uh, whether you require a person within objects, uh, love, or uh, time, or whatever, it's, um, it's a human question and problem, I think. Uh, it's a human concern. And I don't know if this will show up in all its detail, but it's quite a painting. Well, that's, that's a, in fact, you asked me how long it took me. I, I think I worked on this particular piece three weeks, uh, laboring, uh, I don't know, uh, three days initially, or four days to complete it, but then laboring on edges to bring it up to a present-day vision. That's, um, it represents the state of uh, life and decadence within the natural killed. All of those objects I obtained off of the highway, 
where the cars had uh, run them down, whether it be butterflies or rabbits or squirrels. And I wish, I wish the camera could show up the flies crawling all over the dead rabbit, which to some people might be repulsive, but it makes it... How about the stench of, of <laughs> decaying matter? I can, I can almost smell it. Yeah. Okay, Don, this was done very recently, and it's, should we call it Phil's Street? Yeah, <laughs> Phil's, <laughs> Phil's backyard? Yeah, we painted uh, outside of Phil's studio uh, one day, uh, the three of, it, three of us painted, and uh, I was particularly attracted to the color and the solidity of the little segment of the parking lot and a closed uh, diner. We'd done it on a Sunday. This, this and, uh, again is in the exhibition, isn't it? Yeah. It's too bad the colors don't show up, the bright reds and yellows in the uh, sign in the uh, building, the doors mm -hmm. of the building. And, Quite a contrast. Yeah, it's quite a rundown old buildings, but quite beautiful in their own way. And I, I think that's what we generally are trying to do as street painters, find some of the uh, beauty and the reality in things in the city, uh, things that might ordinarily be called ugly, uh, have a great deal of character. Just, we're running out of time. We have two minutes left. We'll just show briefly, Don, yours looking down from the 16th floor onto a building on tw off of 2nd Avenue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And should we show this one of, yeah, of me? Yeah, yeah please do, please do. That's a beauty, yeah. This is a what size pastel? That's about four feet wide by almost six feet high. <clears throat> and uh, I did this in the studio, and I'd seen many people standing outside Bloomingdale's department store on 59th Street. We I had a studio there at one point. And um, so I recreated a shopper outside of Bloomingdale's window with a, a display of dresses and uh, sort of a, a questioning, searching, what I felt was a, a real uh, character study of you, but also a modern mankind in a sense, uh, lost in the 20th century or searching for answers in the 20th century, or a place that a human being can be human in the 20th century. Uh, we only have about one minute left. All right, we don't have any more time. I hope you'll see the exhibition. It's at the Ingber Gallery, 3 E 78th Street. The show is up until August 1st. I'm Jesse Gray. Have a good week.